So welcome to our ASCG webinar for today. Uh, today we have speaking Alberto Ardid Segura from the University of Auckland in the Geothermal Institute. Um, but I would just like to go through a few housekeeping slides before we move into Alberto's talk. I'd like to start by saying a huge thank you to our corporate members. So we have our corporate plus members, high size, total seismic and bell size and our corporate members, Southern Geoscience Consultants and Santos. So we really appreciate the support that our corporate members continue to give us. And the, the money that they donate to the ASCG goes towards uh, helping us to fund our events and publications um, and all sorts of uh, things that we're able to do within the society. But it also goes towards the Research Foundation, which helps support geophysics, uh, honours, masters and PhD students. I'd also like to thank our branch sponsors uh, for the South Australian Northern Territory, New South Wales and Western Australia branch. And we're really grateful for this support and uh, this would typically go towards uh, helping us to put on our branch events, which are usually face-to-face uh, -face events, often held each month, which at the moment we're switching to webinars, but hopefully in some states we uh, should be able to start doing some face-to-face -face events soon. But thank you very much for this ongoing support to our sponsors. So at the end of the talk today, we will be having a Q&A session. So if any questions pop up uh, during the talk, um, feel free to write them in the Q&A box or the chat box uh, and we will address, Alberto will address them at the end. Uh, alternatively, when we get to the Q&A section, you can press the raise hand button and do it that way and we can unmute your microphone so you can ask the question when it's your turn. Uh, we have a bumper week of webinars this week, so this is the first of three for the week. So tomorrow we have Dr. Bob Musgrave from the New South Wales Geological Survey, who will be talking about state of the arc, long wavelength geophysics and Macquarie Arc Basement. Uh, Thursday the 20th of August, uh, 2 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, we've got uh, Dr. Adam Smirowski, uh, who will be talking about HeliTem 2, new technology in airborne TEM for deep and covered targets with Western Australia examples. So make sure you registered it and check, come along and check those out. Uh, and we have a couple more coming up uh, the week after and in September by uh, Megan Miller and Alison Kirkby. Um, but as always, just check the ACG website uh, in the events section to see all the upcoming webinars and to register. Uh, just a quick reminder of the benefits of becoming an ASCG member. So ASCG members get uh, free copies of Exploration Geophysics, which is a high quality research uh, journal uh, that um, includes things like case studies, um, geophysical method papers. Uh, well, you also uh, get a copy of Preview, which is the ASCG um, magazine, sorry, and Along with a lot of other benefits, for example, uh, reduced entry to the AEGC conferences, where our next one is in uh, September, I think it is off the top of my head next year. Um, you get free entry to regular technical events or reduced entry uh, that are held within the different branches. Um, and, you know, there's lots of different social events. And of course, the networking opportunities are invaluable for all of these events. Um, and we do um, provide uh, benefits to students, so it's free to become a member if you're a student and we have regular travel scholarships and grants along with the ASCG Research Foundation funding as well that I've already mentioned. So uh, jump onto the website or send one of us an email if you'd like more information on being a member. And just uh, keep in touch with us as well on social media and we'll put uh, the, all of these links in the chat uh, section shortly. Oops, sorry, just got out of that. Uh, yep, so uh, with that, that's all of my housekeeping slides. Um, so I will hand us, I will hand the screen over to Alberto, who uh, will be presenting his work on 
Bayesian magnetotelluric conversion using structural priors for imaging shallow conductors in geothermal fields. And so Alberto is, uh, he has a master's in geophysics study at the University of Chile. And he's a current doctoral candidate at the Geothermal Institute in the, at the University of Auckland. So his uh, research focused on studying the electrical resistivity distribution in geothermal fields through Bayesian magnetotelluric inversions. And that allows assimilating data from different properties such as lithology and temperature and quantifying uncertainty. Prior to that, he worked on shallow active and passive seismic exploration on geothermal systems. And he also has industry experience uh, mostly related to R&D in direct current, gravity and magnetic geophysical methods for mining and basin research. So uh, that's uh, some bio and good luck for the rest of your PhD as well, Alberta. And we look forward to hearing your results. So I'll turn off my screen share and then you should be able to uh, jump on and take over. Thanks. Okay, great. So thanks uh, for coming to see this presentation. Thanks to Kate and the people from the, uh, from the webinar series for inviting me. So today I'll be talking, uh, well, uh, as you know now, uh, my name is Alberto Ardid and I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Auckland. So today I'll be talking about a Bayesian magnetotelluric inversion using this, uh, I will be introducing this concept of structural priors for, Im for imaging shallow conductors in geothermal fields. Uh, this is a work that I have been developed as part of my PhD that I developed jointly with David Dempsey and Rosalind Archer from the University of Auckland, uh, with Ted Bertram from the GNS in New Zealand, uh, GNS Science, Fabian Sepulveda from Contact Energy, also in New Zealand, with Flora Solon from the National Observatory of Brazil, and with Pascal Taritz from the University of Press in France. So, what is a geothermal field? Well, a geothermal field is, uh, well, geothermal areas or regions of the, of the earth close to, the, close to the surface that presents a relatively high heat flow. This high heat flow is a result of a deep, is usually a result of a deep a magmatic intrusion or a cooling pluton that works as a heat source. And when you have a near, the, near the surface, when you have a permeable structure, that contains water that inflows like uh, beneath it, uh, you could be, and if, and if this, uh, this is what we call basically the reservoir, when this permeable structure near the surface is filled with water and if the heat source is high enough, it could produce, it could produce some uh, convection, uh, convection cells of, of this hot water, right? So, and, then if we, if we can access to this water by drilling wells that then we can use to extract some heat water, some, some, uh, some water that is, yes, really hot, and then we can generate some electricity with it. This is a resource that if we exploit sustainable, it could give us practically unlimited, unlimited less energy. Now, if we, if we look closer to this reservoir, what we will see is that on top of the reservoir, we will, found, we will find a cap, rock, a cap rock, which is a low permeable formation, a low permeable formation that prevent hot fluids to reach the surface, as it, as it is shown here. Now, this, this, this low permeable formation is submitted to really prolonged times of hydrothermal alteration, product of, of the environment, of the conditions there. And as a result of these prolonged periods of hydrothermal alteration, uh, it will present a significant amount uh, of conductive clays. So this low permeable formation full with conductive clays is what we call the, conduct, uh, the clay cap, right? And this clay cap is what we will be focusing during this presentation and is what we are trying to image with the method that I'm going to show you. So well, how do we observe this clay cap? Well, the clay cap, uh, 
the clay cap we can observe it by two ways by direct uh, measurement by direct by direct observation in wells but also from an indirect ob obser observation from the surface so in terms of the wells by this direct me in measurement from wells uh, we use a, a technique called uh, a titration technique called methylene blue that gives us an idea of the relative amount of clays for different sections of the well. This is kind of an example of how could it look like a, 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 these methylene blue profiles. And we also have this indirect measurement from the surface. That's the other way that we can access to observe the, the clay cap. And this is where geophysics came in where as it is a, uh, as it is a, a cap rock that present that have like a high conductive behavior is especially sensitive to electromagnetics and electric methods. Uh, amongst all of the, these electromagnetic methods in geophysics, uh, magnetotellurics has been proved to be the most successful one in capturing the main features of this, of, of the geometry of this clay cap that is usually found on top of this geothermal reservoirs, right? So we have two ways of observing it. And what are we doing? What are we doing? What we're doing is, a, or what we develop here is a joint modeling of the empty data and the, uh, and the methylene blue data from the wells. So we use, in, we combine in the modeling and the indirect measurement from the surface with direct measurements in the wells. Uh, and we invert to obtain the resistivity and electrical resistivity distribution that could give us an image of this highly conductor section on top of the reservoir. And to do that, we develop a 1D constrained inversion of the end of empty signals that is based on Markov change Monte Carlo or NCMC. And, it's, and, it's cons and the inversion is constrained by, by information from wells, in particular, the, the methylene blue ones that I commented you about. And this joint modeling approach is focused specifically in the uncertain estimation of the clay cap boundaries. So all of the inversion that we design is focused on obtaining the information of where, of where the top and the bottom boundary clay cap are. Yeah, and with uh, hopefully with uncertainty, with uncertainty. And then we also explore some other implications in terms of the temperature distribution that can be derived from this result of the geometry of this uncertain geometry of this clay cap. And how we do it? What I'm showing here is that this top figure is, a, is an scheme of a field configuration and data collection on top of a geothermal field where, the, where it's dominated by where the main feature of this geothermal field is this clay cap with a really low conductive uh, well, uh, behavior on top of what is what is what is like the the geothermal reservoir with the hot water in these convection cells, and what I'm showing here are three empty stations and what could be a well, and so what we do for them is each empty station we invert them in one D, looking for three layer models, looking for three layer models like this, that from and from there we can why three layers? Because from there we can extract or we, or we can construct distribution for those boundaries which are related, which will be related to the top and the bottom boundaries of, the, of, this, uh, of this clay cap. What is important to notice here is that, for example, for this station that is seen, seen that is close to a well with methylene blue data, we will use the methylene blue data, which is this relative measurement of the clay content, to constrain the set of models that we are inverting for in an stochastic way. So from and from there we will obtain. The idea is to invert, uh, to invert, obtaining consistency with the empty data, but also what the information of the clay content is indicating. Once we have done that, we uh, we sample or reconstruct distributions for the top and the bottom boundaries of the clay cap in the location of each station and then uncertain interpolate them to obtain kind of a, some type of envelopes that give us an idea of the distribution of the top and the bottom boundaries of the clay cap. What is important to notice here is that when you are close to a well that contain methylene blue data, 
the distributions for those or the non-uniqueness that you resolve for the empty station will be much more narrower than compared to further stations that are far from this, uh, from, from this information of clay content. So in the kind of in the in the core of our inversion rely is uh, relies a base equation which in in the inversion framework for geophysics uh, is used for estimating kind of the most probable models and quantify uncertainty on those models. And the base equation contain three terms: uh, the posterior the posterior PDF, the likelihood function, and the prior PDF. Uh, first of all, this prior PDF or prior uh, probability density function of the model parameters is the place that you include your expert knowledge, your expert knowledge about, or, or is the place how you include how you think the parameters should be distributed before seeing any data. So it's basically is where you model or where you introduce to your inversion, your previous conception about how should, what the behavior of, your, of the parameters of your model should be. Then the likelihood function is the place where we fit the data by forwarding plausible models. So we forward a bunch of plausible models and test them against the, against the, the data that we are observing. And in that way, what the likelihood doing, what the likelihood function is doing is basically updating your prior belief that you established first in, the, in this prior PDF. Once you have done that, you can construct uh, these posterior uh, probability density functions over the model parameters, which is basically the set of most probable models, uh, the most probable models. Why this is important? Because from there, from this set of most probable models, you can quantify the uncertainty on the, on the parameters of your model. Okay, so in our, in our, like in our, in the structure of our problem, what we are, the model, the, the way that we are using Bayesian equation in our, in our, in our inversion is by applying it to, to these uh, 1D three layer resistivity models. So these are the type of models that, that, that we will be forwarding in the likelihood to see how they fit the, the data. And this model represent basically three elements, uh, a first layer con uh, consisting of sediments, a second layer consisting of, uh, over, which is a conductor representative of the clay cap, and then a third layer trying to capture the, the reservoir. Why a three layer model? Because we are interested in capturing the boundaries of the clay cap or the top and the bottom boundaries of the clay cap, which are, which will be, which uh, will, we will be the extracting from the, interfaces from the from this three layer model so uh, first of all the prior so the prior is how we think uh, the parameter should look like before seeing any data the key point of this inversion is that this previous this previous idea of how the parameter should look like we build them using the methylene blue data and we construct this new concept uh, that, I, that we call structural priors so from the methylene blue data, from the methylene blue data, we will we model them to, con to construct these uh, structural priors that give us a first inference of where the clay cap boundaries are. Then for the likelihood is the place that we will be, that we will be uh, updating our prior belief or inverting for the, or feeding the, the empty data for multiple three layer models, right? So in that way, we will be modeling, we will be selecting the models that are consistent with the empty data, but are also have some type of consistency with the clay content derived from the structural prior. And once done, done, uh, we we'll, we'll construct the posterior PDF or be over the model parameters, which are basically distributions for the five parameters of our models, uh, the five parameters that I put here, and from there, we will extract the parameters that define the boundaries to construct uncertain top and bottom boundaries of the inferior, of the inferior clay gap. Okay, but now how do we go from the methylene blue data to the methylene blue priors? How do we construct these structural priors? What I'm showing here in these two figures, so if we focus first here, this is depth and this is methylene blue percentage. This is basically a real, 
this is a real this is real data of methylene blue percentage in a in, in some well in a in a geothermal field and the, well these blue dots is the data and uh, the first thing that you can notice from here is that most of the clay or the inferior clay from this methylene blue is located around this depth right so this gives us a first inference of where the clay cap is there so the next question is how do we transform this information in useful in usable distributions for the boundaries that uh, to construct like these structural priors on the boundaries uh, and we abort that uh, by modeling uh, this data by kind of inverting it this data also in a mcmc approach that we can discuss later but basically feeding a squares functions a squares function in a in an mcmc scheme to obtain all of the all of the squares functions that are consistent uh, with the with with this data and from there what we do is sample or construct distributions for the top of the square function that is related to the top of of the of the clay cap and for the bottom and that's what i'm showing here so from those square function we construct distribution of the most probable location of the top and the bottom boundaries of the clay cap derived from the methylene blue inversion and from there so we perform that for a bunch of wells and then interpolate those, those, those distribution to the location of the empty stations to the location of the empty stations and uh, and, in, and in that position we construct the structural prior for the for the empty inversion cool okay and this is how it looks like how it looks a, uh, an empty station in uh, in a geothermal field this is real data uh, if we focus first for example here in the apparent resistivity this is, so this is period this is period and this is the apparent resistivity and I'm showing here just two components, the non-diagonal components of the impedance tensors for the apparent resistivity on the face. And where you can, where the data are the dots in blue and green. And what you can see from here is that is the data is basically for until around the period 10, like a slightly less, but around 10. Most of the data is 1D and then just the data split indicating that you are entering into a 2D or a 3, a 3D environment. So we cut for before the before any inversion, as we are inverting in 1D, uh, we cut the, the the periods until here, and, and we just invert for this section, the 1D section. That's kind of the the first thing to notice, and the thing and the second one will be that that you can clearly see here that uh, the presence of a really low conductor that is pushing the signal down and then going up. And in this section, this, this part of the curve is that this, the, the shape of this curve is, is, is what we related to this super high conductive clay cap. Cool. Also, I'm showing here this, all of these uh, blue lines are forward, are forward samples from the posterior. So from the posterior, we extract all of the most probable models and then we forward them. To, con to compare them with the real data. And what we can see here is that for most of the samples, uh, the feed is pretty well until the period that we are inverting for, right? Uh, but, and then if we move to the next, uh, to this figure, what I'm showing here, so this is depth, and this is in the, in the X axis is depth and the Y axis is uh, resistivity. And these are all of the three layer models on top of them these are all of the three layer models that generate these samples. So as you can see, all of these, all of these three layer models are consistent with the data. And you can clearly see here like how non-unique, how the non-uniqueness from the, if in this problem arises. One of the important thing to notice here is that for the parameters, for the parameters that define the top and the bottom boundaries of the conductor or the inferior clay cap, we can see that for the top of it, we don't get like a, most of the results are, most of the model are in the same place, showing not too much uncertainty. But for the bottom, for the bottom boundary of the conductor of this, uh, or the inferior clay cap, we can clear, clearly see how the uncertainty is much, much higher, right? And then, so that's kind of the first lesson. And the second, and, and, and from those models, we can, 
we can obtain, we can extract or we can sample the parameters behind those models to construct these histograms of the models. And from there, we are, uh, we are quantifying the uncertainty uh, that is uh, related to the estimation of that particular uh, parameters for that model, right? And we perform this for all of the stations. But one an, an important question that arises here is, so in terms of this structural prior, so the, the data that I showed you before was inverted uh, with, the, uh, with the structural prior based on the methylene blue information. But an interesting question there is how do we, uh, why is useful, right? So to abord that, uh, abord that question, what I'm showing you here is another station with similar behavior. You, you see like 1D behavior until, until almost 10 seconds. And we invert until that point. And this, uh, this plot is showing the apparent resistivity and the samples, right? For, uh, for the same station using the structural prior based on the methylene blue data and without the structural priors, uh, without using that, that structural priors. So here is we see the RMS. So this RMS is the average RMS of all of the samples for the range of period that we invert in for, right? And we obtain an average RMS there of, uh, of 0.85, which is, uh, which is a, an, an acceptable, a really low one. And also I'm showing here in Magenta, the minimum misfit sample would give you like, a, would give you an RMS of 0.58, which is really low too. But if we see the, the, the one that I'm not using, the structural prior, the RMS is also by an acceptable one, 1 1.0, and for the minimum misfit is the same. So in terms of the RMS or, or in terms of feeding the data, basically the story is the same. We are not gaining any information from here. But when we see the, when we see the models that generate those samples for both cases, the story is completely different. So for the, when, we, when we use the methylene, the, the methylene blue prior or the, the structural prior, we obtain for the parameter that control the, the thickness of the conductor, we obtain a, an average, an aver a medium, sorry, of 161 meters with an error of 64 or 64 meters. And when we invert without the methylene blue, the, the structural prior, we obtain a conductor thickness of 284 meters with, a, with, an, with an error that is practically more than the double of the previous one. So from here, you can see that both, of, both, both inversion are feeding the data well or acceptable, but the models that are behind them are completely different. So what is happening here, what's, what is happening here is when using the method in blue prior, give us the chance. So we're in, when we use the method in blue prior, we invert for models that are consistent with the empty data and with the clay content based on the method in blue information. In that way, it allows to discriminate between plausible models that are consistent with the data. That's the whole point of it. And and it also helps us to reduce the uncertainty on the model parameters, right? So that's kind of the, the, the big picture. This is why it is useful because it helps us to discriminate between plausible models that are consistent with the data. So let's jump to a field example. So I will be showing you some examples for the Wairaki geothermal field in New Zealand. So what you can see in this map is a map, well, this is a map of the North Island of New Zealand, where I highlight here this blue square. This section, uh, this section is showing the Taupo Volcanic Zone, which is a continental, which is a, an active continental rift that is expanding like seven millimeters uh, per year. So it's a pretty active one. And it's a region that go from Lake Taupo to White Island. Here, White Island is the volcano that exploded a month, some months ago, and this is a this is showing a close up to that to that region to that square. And what I'm showing here in this map is a surface DC resistivity results from uh, from a DC resistivity survey conducted in the 80s that was developed uh, to try to uh, uh, to try to identify the geothermal fields in this area. And it was pretty effective. And from this study, uh, they they found they found 
around 20 geothermal fields. So this is basically the, the red sections are showing high surface resistivity based on DC, DC resistivity analysis, right? So, and if we close up to this section, these are, oh, by the way, they are like a more than 20 geothermal fields here. And one of them, the oldest one, is the one here, which is the one that I highlighted here. And this is the wide like, geothermal field. All of these uh, resistivity contours define what is considered now as the wire key uh, of the wire key geothermal field. Oh, so uh, this is the data set that I am working with that I will be showing some results. Uh, the, the magenta cruxes are showing the empty stations that, are, that I modeled in this, uh, uh, with this, in this example. And the squares inside are showing the locations of wells where the, uh, where for some of them, so we have uh, around like 250 empty stations that cover most of the field. Here the field is defined by this uh, DC orange resistivity contour. And we also have information from wells that for, for of around 130 wells, that for some of them we have, for most of them we have temperature profiles, and so only for some of them, around 35, we, we have methylene blue data, this relative uh, indicator of clay, of clay content. And for some of the well, we also have a lithology, so we compare it against to it too. Cool, and I wanna, I wanna you to notice this profile here, which is WK7, that crosses the north section, the north section of the field, the most active part. This is the most active, this is the well-known, more active part of the field. So we have a profile that crosses there. And if we go to that profile, a cross section for that profile, this is the figure that is uh, behind it. So in this figure, uh, what I'm, first of all, the, so these red squares on top of it are the locations of the empty stations across that profile, right, from east to the west. And uh, the first thing to notice here is that uh, this orange and this orange and blue envelopes that are, that are, are our results for the uncertain estimation for the top and the bottom boundaries of the clay cap, of the inferior clay cap for this profile. And this is constructed by each of the empty station, for example, this one, we inverted in 1D, we obtained distributions for the top and the bottom boundary, and then uncertainly interpolated them between a station to construct this, uh, to, con to construct these envelopes, which give us a special idea of the distribution of, this, of the uncertain top and bottom boundaries of the, of the clay cam. Uh, so for the infill section, another interesting thing to notice here, this is where it's like the most active part, the infill section. We can see that for the bottom of the inferior clay cap for, for our method, ah, first of all, uh, this, uh, this, are, this is lithology from wells. So the blue squares, uh, the blue boxes at the bottom are showing, uh, are the names of different wells. That are close to the that are close to the to the profile, not exactly in the same position, but close to it, and that distance is uh, is put here in kilometers. And what we can see from that lithology is that for the bottom of, for example, for the bottom for the inferior top uh, bottom of the conductor or bottom of the inferior clay cap, we can see a. Uh, how it clearly correlates with the top of this blue formation, which is the Wyora formation. And that Wyora formation is the one that is related to the reservoir, is the permeable formation that contains all of the water. We can also see that this bottom of the conductor is, really, is clearly correlated for the infill section with this green formation. And this green formation is the hookah fall formation, which is the formation that is known to have like the higher degree or high range of of hydrothermal alteration. Basically, it's the, it's the formation that contains all of the clay. Oh, another interesting thing to notice here is that here for these two stations, our methodology is, uh, is able to capture the absence of the clay cap. So that's our, our, our result of the inversion team. 
another way to look uh, to look uh, the result from this inversion is what the, is the one that I'm showing here. So the so the scatter plot is showing locations for all of the empty stations that we inverted, and the color of the scatter plot is showing the depth to the top of the inferior clay cap, or to the top of the conductor. And what we can see from there is that for the active zones in the middle of the field, the, 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 the clay cap is, is shallower, is, is really close to the surface, and, and when you get to the boundaries of it, defined by this DC resistivity boundary, it goes deeper. So it have like the same, the same shape that I showed you before. Another interesting point here is that these cruxes are places, are a station that our method uh, infer the absence of clay cap or is indicating an absence of clay cap. And we can see that that is also correlated with, the, with this, this previous DC resistivity boundary. Except for this section, except for this section that our method is inferring the presence of a clay cap, but much, but much deeper than the, what is infill. And that's probably the reason of why uh, the DC, the, this DC resistivity condor is not capturing because DC resistivity surveys have a much shallower penetration depth than the MT. And, and it's probably not capturing this deep section of the, of the clay cap, right? So this is another interesting way to look at this data. And, and of course, uh, collecting all of the results from the inversion for the top, for, for the depth of the top and the bottom boundaries of the inferior clay cap, we can construct histograms like this one that, that give us an idea of the, of the distributions of the parameters. In this case, for example, if we look at this one, this is the CIRA 2, con, uh, is basically the thickness of the inferior clay cap. And we construct histograms based on the result for all of the station and give us and it gives us like useful information. So now I will show you a couple of examples that, that are like applications that derive from our results, from the previous result, from the this uncertain geometry of the inferior clay cap based on the empty inversion. So in this first case, as I mentioned you before, I have a, we have a, a bunch of well, a bunch of wells available with temperature profiles. So this scatter plot is showing the location for all of the temperature profiles, and and from those temperature profiles, what we did was so from this from the uncertain estimation of the clay cap for the whole field. From there, we can infer what should be, where the, the depth for where the top and the bottom boundaries of the clay cap should be in the locations of the wells. So in the location of each well, we have an inferior top and bottom boundaries depth for the clay cap. And then in, in, in using the temperature profiles, we can sample temperatures on those boundaries to check what are the temperatures uh, at the bottom and at the top of the clay cap in the location, in the wells location. And what I'm plotting here, and what I'm plotting here is that, is the is basically the temperature distributions at the bottom of the conductor. So for all of the wells, we extract from the temperature profiles samples of, of the based on the of the location of the inferior bottom of the of the conductor. And we can plot it like especially to give an idea of where are the hottest part of the reservoir, what are the hottest part of the upper reservoir eh, from the eh, in the location of the wells. Right, so we can see again that most of the most of the high temperatures are located here in the expected place, which is the most like the the, the known active zone. Right, and then if we collect all of the all of those samples from uh, from the temperatures at the top and at the bottom of the inferior clay cap, we can construct again histograms and learn about what are the temperatures at the top and the bottom. What are the distribution for the temperatures? At the top and at the bottom uh, the boundaries of the of the inferior clay cap, and this is another interesting uh, application of our of our three D of our like pseudo three D on inferior like geometry for the clay cap. So I want to put your attention here first in this plot. This plot, what I'm showing, the red dots are the, de are the temperatures and the depth, 
the depth and the temperatures for the for in the locations of the wells in the location of the wells derived from from our inversion so from for as i shown you before we have for every well we have an inferior depth for the top and the bottom boundaries of the clay cap and we have temperatures there so we can plot them in like in these scatter plots and then we can connect the the points between them to get an idea or to or basically to calculate the temperature gradient that is inside of the conductor right and as you can see here in this temperature gradient uh, plot that those are pretty consistent between them that then if we and if we create a histogram of, of all of those slopes here that indicate temperature gradient inside inside of the clay cap uh, we obtain a we obtain a histogram like this that give us that have a medium value of uh, 475 uh, degrees per kilometers which is really high right but it's what you should but it's basically in the range of of what you should expect for a high temperature geothermal field as as, as wire again right so this is kind of the the this is kind of the temperature gradients that you find in these like really hot places of the crust and what I'm showing here is the special distribution. So the scatter plot is showing the special distributions of those gradients that the color, the color bar is here. And again, you can see that most of the, the high uh, linear temperature gradients are concentrated in a region. Another, uh, another aspect that I want to highlight here is this, uh, is, is this plot. I want to put your attention here. So basically, I'm, I'm, going, I'm not going to go uh, I'm not going to give too much details about it here, but we basically develop a, a methodology that allows us to quantify the, uh, the heat flux, the heat flux in the location, through the heat flux through the clay cap in the locations of the well. And how we do it is basically as we have for each well, we have for each well, we have Sample, sample depth and sample temperatures at the top and at the bottom boundaries. And we have the profiles, the temperature profiles between them. We model those profiles to capture, uh, to, to capture the advective, the combination of the advective and the conducted heat flux that is passing through that section that allows to quantify the total heat flux that is passing through the, through the clay cup. And what if we do that for all of the wells, we obtain a mean, a, a medium value for the heat flux for the infield section of about like two watts uh, per meter square, which is kind of a, a density, a density a, a approximation of the of, of how much heat is being is, is being transported through the clay cap in those particular positions. And what I'm plotting here related to it is. So what we did was we calculate this combination of advective and convective heat flux in, the, in each well location. And then we construct a grid, a grid for all of the field that, I, that I'm showing here. And then we interpolate those heat flux to the location of, to, the, to all of the locations of the grid. And this is what I'm showing here in this figure. So this figure is showing in the, in back in the in the back part the agreed for heat flux x calculated for for estimation of heat flux in well locations right and again you can see how the and well this gives us the chance to try, try to understand what is the heat flux distribution through the clay cap uh, for the uh, for the most of part of the field right and then the final part here is that if we integrate all over this region, all over this region, what we obtain, or what we obtain is an approximation of the total natural state heat flux that is flowing through the clay cap uh, for, for this particular field. And what we obtain by doing that is a value of 368 uh, with an error of 18 megawatts, which is a slightly, which is around like 20% less that what uh, of, of the heat flux that has been estimated for the field based on some other uh, tools that relies mostly on, on geochemistry. So this is kind of a, 
why it is important because it gives us it's, it's kind of a new tool of estimating these heat flux natural state heat flux values. Cool. Okay, great. And what I'm going to show you now is a bonus track that I developed especially for this webinar. So what I'm going to show you is basically another application, another application of these structural priors that I use, uh, that I construct based on salinity profiles. Instead of constructing the structural priors based on methylene blue, as in the previous guide for the geothermal field, in another environment, uh, I will be showing you how to construct uh, this structural prior to constrain empty inversions by using salinity profiles. So if you have been, uh, if you have been following this webinar series, you probably remember these two figures. These two figures are, uh, were presented by Chloe Gustafsson like a month ago. Um, and if you are interested in this work, you can, you can see this figure and all of the work in this paper that I leave you here. And what these two figures are showing, well, the first one is showing the conceptual model of an offshore groundwater reservoir. So basically here is what, is, what it should be a, a, an offshore groundwater, freshwater reservoir confined by two units of sedimentary units that contains probably uh, with, with saline water infiltration, right? And the, this conceptual model is kind of a derivation of this 2D, uh, 2D joint inversion of MT and CSEM data. Uh, well, that you can follow here in the, in the paper that I leave you. But I, well, what the base, the main aspect that is this two inversion is showing is the presence of this conductor, of this resistor here, sorry, that is related to, the, to, a, to a freshwater off, uh, offshore uh, reservoir. No? But I want to put your attention on this square. I will be showing you an example using just the elements in this square. So in this square, you have an empty station and also a salinity profile. So these salinity profiles are basically a estimation of the salinity content for different positions for different depth in a well. So it gives us an idea of where, it gives us an idea of the relative amount of salt in the profile and thus giving us the chance to try to understand where the, uh, the, the fresh water is comparable to other sections that could present like salty water, right? And we will be using, so we will, be, in, in our target, in our approach will be to infer on certain boundaries for this uh, fresh water aquifer, right? Using, uh, using salinity profile as an structural, as an structural constraint or a structural prior for the empty inversion. Okay, if we, if we just focus on that square, what I'm showing you here, this is, a, this is a, the empty data from that station, that if we go close to it, I'm just showing again, just the non diagonal this is the apparent resistivity for the non-diagonal components of the, of the impedance tensor. And what you can see here in both figures is that basically most of the data is 1D until one second. And in this case, we have this, uh, and, the, and the main aspect or the main feature is this, the, is the curve going up and then going down. And this, and this behavior probably is mostly controlled by this contrast between uh, sediments with salt, uh, with salt, uh, with intrusions of, of salty water and fresh water. And this is how the salinity profile for that wells, for that well looks like. And they're like kind of really close to each other, so we can use them. And, uh, and what this salinity profile is showing is basically that for kind of the first hundred meters, you have a section with a lot of uh, amount of salt, and then you go down to a section with much less salt, which uh, which is related to the with, to a freshwater aquifer, and then goes back again to a salty section, right? So in terms of the modeling, we will be again using a Bayesian formulation to resolve this problem. But in the end, we will be again, we'll be using a 1D three layer resistivity model. But in this case, the three layers are we related to different like uh, geological features. For the first layer, we will be considering a sediments with saline water intrusion. For the second layer is where the fresh groundwater reservoir is. 
uh, much much more resistive than the previous one. And for the and for the third one, it will be a permeable rock with saline water intrusion. So we have basically a conductor, resistor, conductor, right? And in the basin formulation, we have again we have the posterior, we have the likelihood, and we have the prior. And in this case, we will be constru we construct or we will be constructing an structural prior based on salinity profile because the salinity profiles also contains information about the boundaries of the, of the fresh groundwater reservoir. Cool. And then, so we construct in, in a Bayesian, uh, in a Bayesian ways of, 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 say, of saying it, we will be in fee, given first inference of the presence of the reservoir by the, the structural prior based on the salinity profiles. And then we will be updating that information with new evidence based on the empty data by feeding multiple three-layer models. And then, and from there, we will construct the posterior distribution for the five parameters. And from there, we will extract the parameters that are, that are, that are uh, basically related to the boundaries of the, of, the, of, the, of the reservoir to infer distribution for the top and the bottom boundaries of the freshwater reservoir and to quantify uncertainty on those boundaries. So, so in a similar way for the salinity profile, we just model in a really simple way using the same square function just to obtain distribution of the most probable location for the top and the bottom boundaries of the, of the, of the freshwater reservoir, right? So those are the, so those sections, so those distributions are the one that we will be using as a structural prior from the empty inversion. And then this is what I'm showing here is the, is the, the empty, the, the model of the empty data by using the structural prior and without, and without the, the structural prior in a similar way that I did before. And here I'm just modeling one of the, uh, one of the components of the, of the tensor. This is just kind of a, a proof of concept example. So we just an, it's an initial stage, right? So what we can see is that the samples that I'm showing here, we can, we calculate, well, they are doing kind of a good job fitting like this first uh, curve of the, of the data that is related to the, to the presence of the resistor. And when we calculate the average, when we calculate the average RMS for all of these samples, uh, we can we, we obtain a, a decent RMS of 1.1 and for the minimum and, and for the minimum misfit sample is even lower right and we and when we invert the same station without the structural prior based on this based on the salinity profiles what we obtain is kind of is telling the same story is you are we are getting like a an average RMS of 1.1 again so both of them are saying both inversion and are feeding the, the, the data in a, in a similar way. But when we observe the data, the, sorry, the parameters of the model that are behind those samples, and if we focus, for example, in the, in the, in the parameter that captures the thickness of the aquifer, we obtain a thickness for the, for the second layer or the, the resistor or the aquifer in this case, we obtain a thickness of 330 meters uh, with an error of 64 meters. And without the structural prior, we obtain, we obtain, a, we obtain a thickness of 370 meters uh, with an error of 120, which is almost again the double of the previous case. So in this case, RMS and the misfit and, and the misfit is telling the same story, but when we look at the data, what we see is that the salinity profile is helping us to discriminate between those models to be consistent with the empty data and with the presence of on and with what is being shown by the salinity profiles. So again, kind of the same story. So the one of probably the, the most important key concepts that we went through this presentation is that uh, first of all, what we developed here was an is an is an MCMC 1D F stochastic inversion that is useful, that is particularly useful for incorporate expert knowledge. In this case, when we say expert knowledge, we're meaning different data from other sources of, or from other nature. So it's really suitable for that kind of a incorporation of different data or assimilation of different data in, a, in an inversion like framework. 
it also helps us and it's also useful for quantifying uncertainty on simple models uh, as the one that I show you. And both of them, both of the of this concept that I mentioned are key to the to, to the support decision making process in exploration pro in exploration projects like in exploration in, for geothermal resources of, or water resources in the in the second case. And the other concept that we introduced during the well that I, I introduced during this presentation was the use of methylene blue and the salinity as structural priors. So we construct structural priors to be incorporated for the empty inversion using in the first case, in the geothermal case, methylene blue data, uh, methylene blue data, that, which is a measure of the relative amount of clay. And in the second case, using salinity profile in both, in both, ca in bo both cases to help to discriminate between plausible models that fit the data in the same way and also to reduce uncertainty. So before saying thanks, I wanna, if you are interested in this 1D MCMC MT inversions, I give you, I give you, I leave you here a, my five, paper, five papers that are really interesting to check it out. So one of the, when you, when you start to, one of the important thing to notice when you, when you look through, Paper, through this paper or, or, or my work is how flexible are the MCMC or this Bayesian inversion, how, how can they adapt like to different uh, type of data and, and, and how simple it is. So I, uh, so I invite you to review them and yeah, and have a good journey and thanks. Great, thank you so much. That was a really great talk. Um, Thanks. If everyone would like to uh, start asking your questions, we've had uh, one come through already, but you can use the Q&A or the chat box, or you can raise your hand, but I'll just get to the ones in the chat box before I um, check for any raised hands. Um, so from David Annett's, uh, this came early on in the talk. Um, so he said, uh, it was a great talk. Um, it wasn't clear to him whether you were incorporating uncertainties in your MEB tests in your priors. Could you clarify? Uh, yes. I can, I, I can show you an image. I think it's slightly better for, sorry. Right back to the beginning. <laughs> Okay, cool. So the way that we incorporate uncertainty on the priors is that in the well location, as I show in this figure, uh, you calculate, so we, uh, we sample a bunch of uh, square functions that fit the data and from there we get this uh, uncertain, well, this distribution for the top of the bottom boundaries of the clay cap in the locations of the wells. And then what we do is we interpolate we interpolate those values to the locations of the empty station and but when you as far as you get away from the as far as you get away from the well the uncertainty on those distributions or or basically how uh, how uh, how the, the why they are they increase with the distance as, as you get farther so in the location in the location of a station that is, for example, located between two wells, what you got, what you will have as a prior in that position will be a version, a similar version of what you observe in the closest wells, but with an increased uncertainty because we are penalizing the uncertainty with the distance. Cool. Thank you. Um, so David has a second part as well. Um, clays are known to be polarizable we might expect IP effects to influence derived conductivities, especially at low frequencies. What was your conductivity model? Wait, let me check if I can show you my conductivity model.
Okay, so basically I, I guess that my method is uh, nothing, hap it can say anything about the, about the polarizations of the clay. That's clearly, an, that's kind of a field that I don't manage too much. So I'm sorry for that. But in terms of the conductivities that we are recovering for the clay section uh, is what I'm showing here. So this is the distribution. This is the distribution for the parameters of the posterior. A sample from the posterior that, uh, this is the parameter that control the conductivity of the second layer, which is the one that we model as the conductor or the inferior clay cap, right? And what we obtain as a distribution for it is a really narrower distribution, practically centered at three ohm meters with a small, uh, uh, with a small uncertainty on it, and that, uh, that I will say that that is also like really it's clearly it's really good how we are constraining the value between the boundaries. So that's kind of in, in terms of this inversion, this is the only information that you can get in terms of the conductivities of the clays for that particular section. One of the things that you can that we realize during this is that just to put like some other example is that when you when you invert for a station that is in the middle of the field, the resist the conductor distribution will be different for other stations that are outside of the field that also present clays, but uh, but the temperatures are much higher. So we can the only thing that we that I can say there is that we can differ between hot clays and cold clays to they have, and they have a different uh, conductivity signature, but, but yeah, that's kind of the only information that you can get from, uh, from this type of inversion. Thanks, next question is from Matt Owens. Uh, is there a reason why downhole resistivity or conductivity logs were not acquired? Would those data not be easier to incorporate into your procedure? Uh, probably, I just don't have them. So that's a major issue, but but of but but I guess the way to uh, they could be really easily to be constructed. In that case, in that case, it won't be an structural prior because uh, you can construct. A, so in this case, what I'm controlling is the parameters, is the parameters that define the boundaries of the layers, right? Of course, they are correlated with the with the conductivities inside of it. But the priors that are constructed are from the boundaries of it, so that's why it's kind of an structural prior. But with a resistivity lock, you can you can easily construct priors for the conductivities of the for these parameters, right? For the conductivities of the of, that you are getting. So in that case, it would be really useful for if if we focus here in these three resistivities. So for this station, these three distributions are the resistivities that we are obtaining for the three layers. And for the second and the third one, we are kind of doing a good job constraining them. But for the first one, the shallow part, eh, we actually don't control it too much. This is consistent with the fact that MT doesn't have too much, it's not really sensitive to surface features. But in terms of the, if we incorporate eh, resistivity locks for the shallow section, it will probably help us a lot to constrain the resistivity for the shallower section. So, so yeah, at some point we'll do it. But in this particular case, we are not using it because we don't have that data available. Thanks. So Wenping says, nice talk, and asks how confident you are to use normal distribution to quantify the uncertainty. Uh, well, I will say that in this case, yeah, that's a. Uh, I have two ways of calculating the of calculate. So these normal distribution are basically a result of the posterior. So this is a we are this is actually sampled directly from the posterior. So this is we, then we don't use we, we use the actual samples, not the one that we like model here with a normal Gaussian distribution. But I guess your question is more related to the plot that I was showing before. Okay, here. So when we interpolate, when we interpolate the when we interpolate the distribution between the the wells, so we have okay, we have this prior 
these distributions of the boundaries in the locations of the wells, and then we interpolate them to the positions of the empty stations uh, in the middle, right? But we don't do that interpolating. Uh, we have two ways of doing it. We can sample a normal distribution here and then interpolate those normal distribution. And a second way to do it is to, from the, from the posterior samples here, interpolate the samples and not the distributions. And both of them, we have tried both of them and they give us kind of a similar results because uh, nothing, nothing significant. They, of course, they give like some, some different, slightly different results, but it's not like, it's not like especially, it's not like super important because at the end, what we are doing with this is just con constructing the, our first inference about where the, our, about the boundaries of where the clay cap boundaries are. And then updating, updating that prior belief with the empty station that is not using the, the normal Gaussian like assumptions. So yeah. And, in a, and another way that you can assume that I'm using Gaussian, I guess, is the for the empty inversion. For the empty inversion, you can invert the apparent resistive, at least in my code, you can in, in, in my methodology, sorry, you can invert for the apparent resistivity or you can invert for the for the magnitude of the tensor. And of, of course the phase will go from it. But when you when you invert for the natural for the apparent resistivity, you are assuming that the error is structured with normal Gaussian, but uh, and, and the results that I'm showing in this presentation are modeling the, I was inverting for the apparent resistivity, but now I have moved uh, to inverting the magnitude that is not using the normal Gaussian uh, for the structure of the errors. So, yeah, I don't know if that answered, but did my best, man. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so Stephen Hallinan has said, very nice work, Alberto. But understandable, it's understandable due to compute cost reasons that the MT modeling is 1D so far, dot, dot, dot. Any comments on the uncertainty related to the 3D nature of the clay cap, particularly at the base? Okay, so what we did, of course, uh, what we did to compare our inversion with the, of course, the standard way of doing it. So. So the idea, so in, in, in normal geophysics, in normal geothermal exploration, how it works is you do the survey around the field and then you hire some people to make or, or you can invert it yourself for a, in a 3D deterministic uh, approach, right? So that's kind of the standard way to go. But, uh, so we did it. So I can show you an example of it. So for example, this is an example of using 11 station, 11 empty station and five methylene blue wells, we invert that profile and what, what we obtain is something like this, which is showing like the uncertain top and the uncertain bottom boundary of the clay cap for that, uh, for that a small profile. And to compare it with more standard 3D inversion, uh, we invert the same data uh, using mode M uh, in a 3D, well, a 3D mode M inversion. And what we obtain is something like this, which is showing kind of the same, same features. You have like this conductive section on top of it. And what I'm showing at the bottom is what I'm showing at the bottom. So we have, so we have uh, the same, we have inverted the same data with our method and with a 3D mode M inversion, right? And in the location of each station is what I'm showing here in the location for one station in red, is the resistivity is the resistivity 1D profile derived from the 3D model. And in the blue are samples from our result, right? So as you can see in this three station, basically the three of them are telling the same story, right? They are saying, okay, you have a really good, uh, you, are, you are from the empty, you can capture pretty well the top of the conductor, but for the bottom one, both of them, both of them show the same, basically show the same story, right? But in the case of a deterministic inversion, like a normal 3D inversion, you can see, you can see that a, how the smoothers of the deterministic inversion are, are, are working here, right? Smoothing that section off. Uh, but, the, but the problem with this inversion is, so, so the key point to understand there is how, how much information are you obtaining 
of that bottom boundary. From this deterministic profile, you can say, okay, maybe the boundary is around this section, right? Which is consistent with our 1D model, but in the 1D model helps you, or at least this blocky model allows you to say, okay, this is the section where the, where the uncertainty on the bottom of the conductor is, but we are giving you a distribution in the uncertainty on it, which is much more useful for the people that work with this type of data, making decisions in, the, uh, in, a, in an exploration project, for example. So in that way, uh, I guess, I guess as, as, as developing a 3D stochastic inversion is too expensive, we go for this 1D, but with the main idea that recovering the same information that you are getting with the 3D, but with, a, but with the same information, but actually more because you are giving like uncertainty values for those boundaries, right? So that's kind of the, of the way that we study like the comparison or, or the validation with the actual standard tools that are out there that everybody uses. Great, thank you. I think you've asked all of the questions and we've probably um, kept you here long enough. So um, thank you very much again for a great talk. Um, well, I mean, I'm in a lockdown, so I can, you know, this. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you've got a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no one has any last minute questions? All right, well, thank you very much and uh, good luck with the rest of your PhD. I mean, looks like you've done a huge amount of work already, so you just need to wrap it up and put a bow on it, I think, and you're good to go. Um, so thanks everyone as well for attending and we'll see you tomorrow for the next ASCG webinar. And this will be um, up on our YouTube channel in the next few days. Okay, great. Thanks, Kate, and thanks for everybody to listen to me and good luck. No worries. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Oh, bye.